Good. So, so far, I have introduced the perception architecture, how to estimate their parameters with this backprop algorithm, and also like even how to deal, how to use them to solve multi-classification problems, not only binary classification problems. Now, let's see what happens when we have uh, multiple perceptions, but not at the output layer to solve multi-classification problems, but with multiple layers. So for do that, I'll share the screen now. Yeah. So first, my acknowledgement to Kay McGuinness, Eva Moedano, Alice Sairol, and Antonio Bonafonte. You can also see Alice Sairol's lecture on this topic on this video. So first, let's look at the basic limitation that the perception have. So this sir you see here is Marvin Minsky, and he ran uh, some experiments on, on some interesting works about what could you do and you, what you could not do with the perception. As you see, he tried to solve a this X or problem and he couldn't, right? Because if you think about it, uh, the X or problem, and now we'll discuss about it, it's a, it's a task that you cannot solve with a perceptron, even if it looks like kind of so powerful. And this, uh, some people argue that this is one of the reasons why the artificial intelligence was on hold for some time, what's what's called the AI winter, or I think people argue that they have been a few. So remember, what the perception looks like, and especially remember that there's a linear part of the perception um, that actually what it's doing is defining uh, linear decision boundaries in the future space. That's what it's doing. And in, uh, probably you know about the X or problem, okay? And think about this X or problem in a very, very simple setup in which like, uh, so you have this, this input one, input two, and and just color the outputs zero or one. So the XOR logic operation basically says that if you have two digits which are the same, the output should be zero, and if the two digits are different, the output should be one. So imagine that you try to train a perception to solve this task, or a logistic regressor. Um, that's, that's something that you will not be able to address, right? There's, there's no way to fit a line that will leave at one side the red samples, another side of the, of the line, the, the blue samples. And that's a limitation that uh, with, uh, with, with which a lot of people struggle for quite a long time. And basically, we will need something to, so we will need to, to learn a function that looks like this, right? So with one single neuron, with one single perceptron, it's not enough to solve uh, this problem. Actually, this, this complicated or more um, advanced or challenging data distributions is the ones that we have in lots of different types of data. For example, images, audio, or text, which maybe are nowadays the, uh, the most, um, the fields of science in which deep learning is being applied more broadly, follow this kind of more complicated distributions. So what can we do? So there are plenty of way to, to, to find nonlinear decision boundaries for our classes. But in our case, what we are going to do is we are going to learn suitable representations space from the data. If you remember well, at the, when I presented the perception, there was a first magic part in which I was projecting um, the, the docs into one side of, of the feature presentation, X, and the cats in the other side. And I say, okay, this is kind of magic, and we will address later how to do that. This is actually where deep neural networks excel. They are pretty good at learning representations that later you can uh, use with, for example, uh, with linear classifiers or logistic progressions like, like perceptions. So how can we, how do perce multiple perceptrons deal with that? So actually, they do they deal with that by stacking layers of perceptrons. So in the previous model, what we saw is like that by building one layer of perceptrons, one for each class of interest, um, 
we could solve a multi-classification problem. Now, the idea is that we built layers of perceptrons, will be the first layer, but the output of this first layer is another layer of perceptrons. These layers, they are called the hidden layers because the, this, where the data uh, relies, it's that the input uh, layer, this will be the output layer. And when we have these perceptrons in all layers, we often talk about a fully connected layer, in, sorry, fully connected network or, or layer, right? Because all the neurons are connected with all the neurons from the previous layer. Okay, that's what we like, the most classic architecture for uh, neural networks, whether deep or, or not deep. Um, in terms of notation, you can think that uh, this H is the typical notation for the hidden layers, and we can express that if H0, we, we name it as for the input layer, we can express the output of each hidden layer as the G will be the nonlinear activation, Typically, typically, in deep neural networks, these are this will be a ReLU. Then you have the hidden state of the previous uh, layer multiplied by the weights of of the of that layer plus the vector of bias because there's a bias for each of the neurons. And uh, the that the function which is modeled by this multilayer perceptron would be the output of the last sorry this one the output of the last layer, which will be H of L. These um, multilayer perceptrons, as, I, as you already saw earlier, we can think about them as matrices of, of weights. So if we focus on this neuron over here, the neuron is connected to all these input values. So what we have here is like this value over here is H11, so it's the first uh, neuron of the first layer, and its output would be like uh, the nonlinearity of the vector of, of the input layer multiplied by the vector of weights plus the bias. So this will be, in this case, with the first, the input data, H0, this vector W will be this row on this matrix, and the bias, B1, will be this one. So actually like this uh, vectorial notation. So actually this, uh, we like this row, this vector, and, and this, this color in this case. Okay, so I'm just, uh, I'm just develop developing these equations so you get familiar with them. If we move to the next uh, layer, we just go to the next row of the matrix, okay? With this kind of networks, we can solve tasks like solving MNIST digit classification that I mentioned uh, the other day. Remember that these are 10 classes and they put R28 by 28 grayscale images. If we enroll them, it's 784 dimensional vectors. So we could solve uh, this classification problem with an input layer 784 because that corresponds to the amount of pixels that we have in this data. Here there's one, two, hidden layers, one output layer of 10 classes because there are like 10 different digits. We could have tangent hyperbolic units or whatever activation function. And as this is a multi-class problem, on top we will have a softmax on top layer. If you wanted to compute how many parameters does this multi-layer perceptron has, what we would need to do is like for each layer, look at how many, this would be like the matrix of so this first layer, there are 512 neurons multiplied by the input dimensionality of the data. So this will be like the matrix of weights plus the biases. This in the first layer, there's almost half a million parameters. If we go to the second layer, again, 112 uh, neurons. They are connected to the previous 512. It's this one. And as there are biases, there's one bias for each of these neurons. You, will, you also add them, 200K. And the last layer, we have this 512 here, the 10 uh, output classes. This is, a, oops, this is the total amount of parameters that this simple, so more than half a million parameters to estimate. Remember that earlier I was, I was showing you an example of only one parameter. 
with the stochastic with the gradient descent. Now we, we need to do that with uh, millions of parameters. So that's kind of challenging optimization problem. Also, one question for you. Um, okay, I think yeah, I should have deleted this one. Sorry, I will skip this. Um, so what happens when we start adding layers, hidden layers? So when there's a when we start start adding layers and there's some concept of hierarchy, hierarchy of concepts, sorry, uh, that are kind of learned across the layers. That's normally when we talk about deep neural networks. So it's not that there's a number that says multi-layer perception, once it has whatever amount of layers, then it becomes deep. It's more kind of philosophical question of whether if there's a hierarchy of representations that it's better learned. We can think about AlexNet that has eight layers and that's for sure deep learning if you want a reference but mm, there's not a magic number that tells you, okay, at this amount of layers, now you have deep neural networks, and now you are doing deep learning. I would say that you will, if you need a, a GPU, probably, probably you're doing deep learning. Just to finish some curiosity, which actually there's a, there's a, a theorem that says that if we had like only one hidden layer, that would be enough to approximate any, uh, you know, or any function, any universal function. So this this theorem exists, but if you ever uh, read about it, but um, it just says that it, that you need a finite number of hidden neurons, but doesn't tell you like how much. Okay, so it tells you like you can approximate any function with one single hidden uh, layer, but then tell you like how many neurons you would have there. Maybe the, we don't have enough computer computers for that, and it doesn't tell you how to find these parameters. Okay, so there's a mathematical theorem. You may hear about it, but in practice, what everybody is doing is stacking layers because this uh, helps into um, building uh, and training nonlinear boundaries for our classification problems. That has been so, uh, seen as, as very effective. Also, uh, as these parameters, they are uh, of these networks, they are learned with propagation. And earlier, I talked about the chain rule in which, like, by just stacking layers, we just, uh, what we need to do just, just to back propagate the flows and we can estimate the parameters of any amount of layers. I mean, actually, there are some challenges when uh, networks become deep in terms of gradients because they tend to disappear or explode when you train them, but you will see that, that the field has evolved quite a lot lately and now we can have quite stable trainings in which gradients reach uh, all through the network. So actually, uh, this idea of having many layers of perceptrons and estimating the parameters with back propagation, it was already introduced in 1988 or earlier with works like Geoffrey Hinton, and I think I already mentioned this, this uh, mean telling like maybe at that point, it was too early to, to understand the potential. So just to finish, if you will see that in the labs, but if you wanna start uh, working with multilayer perceptrons on PyTorch, here you have an example in which uh, we are concatenating linear layers with tangent hyperbolic uh, nonlinearities and an output with a log softmax uh, to solve a classification problems. If you want to start playing with that, this would be a code snippet that might be helpful for you. Good. So that would be it for this model as well. And I think it's also about time. But if you have questions, I'll stop recording and be happy to answer them.